Hello, good evening everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled, Everything But the Coffee, Learning About America from Starbucks. I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Brian Steinman, Professor of History at Temple University. My name is Andy Mink, and I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. Um, I wanna welcome you back. Uh, I recognize many familiar faces in the attendee uh, roster tonight. Um, as well as some new ones like Monica Hoyer over there in Durham. Uh, we wanna thank you for joining us after work, uh, whether it's just moments from students leaving your classroom or uh, maybe you've been home and had a chance to, uh, to have dinner with your family. Um, it's important for us that we try to meet you with your needs and uh, hopefully these webinar sessions are a convenient way for you to have conversations with experts in the field and scholars. Um, it's important for us to uh, give you the opportunity to infuse your instruction with uh, current understandings, emerging scholarship, um, conversations around these these difficult topics, and sometimes topics that maybe take a, a slightly sideways approach to the way we understand our communities. Uh, um, I want to thank, as I always do, uh, my my staff, Libby Taylor and Mike Williams, who work uh, very hard behind the scenes to uh, connect scholars and teachers. Libby is our primary contact with uh, each scholar as we develop the PowerPoint and the readings. If you have any questions about the webinar series, please reach out to her using her email address for certificates of attendance or for suggestions for the future. Uh, please also um, contact Mike either through his Twitter or his NHC email if you've got questions about our online course catalog. National Humanities Center is uh, located in Durham, North Carolina and we're a place in which uh, the humanities are created. Each year we welcome a fellowship class of university professors who uh, moved to North Carolina, take a full uh, year away from uh, all the many different um, important diversions of their, of their home place, and they, they come to the center each day and they create our understanding of the humanities through their scholarship. They do research, they write books, they have conversations, and it's really a place of, of intellectual laboratory. As a matter of fact, we're currently in the middle of our selection process for next year's fellowship class, and I can tell you that it's a, you know, it's it's more than just interesting to read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of proposals by the best humanist minds in the country. Um, you can also visit our uh, center through our website. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in the last six or eight months uh, redesigning this website, making it more user friendly and also making all of the material and the content that we have produced at the center searchable by topic and by keyword. So if you have a chance to go and visit that, you can not only find the education materials, uh, but also the scholarly materials that are created at the center. Got a couple of quick announcements about our webinar series. Um, we still have one session uh, this spring that has some seats. That's the rescheduled session with Akram Khadr, who is a fellow at the center with his session titled Understanding the Modern Middle East. That's scheduled for April 21st, an important day to Monica. Um, and right now we have about 35 seats left. We also had to reschedule the session with Johnny Smith, uh, professor of history from Georgia Tech. His session on Jackie Robinson and civil rights will now be on April 28th. And again, as I often do, uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to send all of you who have attended each session that you registered for that is to say you have 100% attendance of the one or 20 webinars that you've registered for. You'll be invited uh, with a special VIP bonus track hidden link to join Carolyn Denard to discuss the life and writings of Toni Morrison at the end of the semester. There's some other opportunities coming up I want to put on your radar. Uh, that includes the um, application deadline, which is rapidly approaching for our 10-day summer institute titled Contested Territory, America's Role in Southeast Asia, 1945 to 1975. Our intent in this, uh, this institute is to uh, look at the very complex landscape of Southeast Asia through culture, through literature, through poetry, through um, economics, through uh, political science, uh, through language, to try to understand what really happened when America fought a war there uh, in the 1960s and early 70s. So we are accepting applications. Um, they're due on March the 1st, and we will be limiting this institute to 36 uh, participants from around the country. There is a $2,100 stipend that's attached to this institute. Uh, so if you're interested in coming to the center and spending some time with us this summer, uh, we'd love to see your application in the email sometime soon. I also want to point you towards our online course registration. Uh, this catalog will have five courses that'll be launched in early March. 
each of these courses comes with 35 professional development hours. So uh, that's the equivalent of five of these webinars. So if you're in Southern California and Los Angeles Unified, you've been collecting these webinars. We love having you here. You can also take a course that would equal five of them. And Los Angeles Unified has given us approval to equate those with uh, salary points. And then finally, I'm extremely excited to announce a new summer institute, a five-day summer institute titled Beyond February, Hip Hop and the African American Experience. We'll be working closely with artist in residence, A.D. Carson. A.D., as many of you may remember, did a webinar with us about a year and a half ago. He's, uh, his title is Professor of Hip Hop. He's in the music department at the University of Virginia. And he's recently uh, put together a record that we will base this five-day institute on by exploring key themes of uh, the record and the African-American experience and ways to make um, those themes and topics accessible to students so they can see themselves in the curriculum. Um, this five-day session will be at the center in North Carolina and run from uh, June 29th to July 3rd. It's the last week in June. We are limiting this to 36 participants, so we'd love to have your application uh, to attend and this will be uh, just a remarkable chance to um, find different access points for some really important and complex uh, themes ones that i'm going to suggest we don't want to teach just in the month of february as black history month so go to our website if you'd like to see information on any of those uh, please also let us know uh, through email or uh, twitter if you've got specific questions our teacher advisory council including uh, ginger park is an important part of the work that we do. Each year we select a cohort of teachers from around the country who uh, help make sure, help us make sure that our work is relevant and connected to the classroom. It's very important to us that we encourage and support teacher leadership and agency. We hope we do that through events and activities like this, resources we create, and really just the collaboration that we invite and encourage between scholar and educator. Uh, a lot of these TAC members are in the uh, room tonight, including Duke Ritchie. I see him down there in Chattanooga. Um, please do uh, look for the application for next year's Teacher Advisory Council this coming March. So our webinar is about to begin uh, in earnest, and I want to remind you that uh, you have an important role to play tonight that is in the chat box. Many of you have begun to use it already. You've introduced yourself. You have uh, told us where you're from. I'd like you to go ahead and uh, tell us uh, how many cups of coffee you had today. It's that chat box where you will register questions and you will uh, make comments that I can bring to the conversation with Professor Simon. I'd also encourage you to talk to each other, share ideas, share resources, share ways that you might use uh, the material tonight in your own instruction. Sometimes it'll be directly in your curriculum, other times it might just be in conversations you have with students. But the idea, of course, uh, is, that, is that what you learn tonight, the conversations you engage in will uh, have impact in your classroom. So tonight I'm uh, pleased to welcome Bryant uh, Simon, Professor of History in Temple University to the Humanities and Center webinar series. Um, give me just one minute, Brian, and I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, there we go. Uh, Bryant is joined tonight by Rhonda Watton. Rhonda is a part of our Teacher Advisory Council and we have started this year inviting them to play what we're calling a TA role. So Rhonda's going to be in the chat box. She's going to be commenting, asking questions, responding to you, sort of um, filtering the conversation that Brian and I have about his topic in his book into ways that you might use it in the classroom. So please do discuss this with Rhonda, who just recently was elected as a member, a returning member, a two-time member of the uh, Board of Directors of the National Council for Social Studies. Um, please uh, work with her and talk to her in the chat box. Bryant, you're with us now. Thank you so much. I am. How are things in Philadelphia? Everything's good here in Philadelphia. <laughs> that's that's a good way to say it. Uh, Bryant, I'm going right. to give you the I, I'm going to give you the mouse in it just a moment. Today here. Yeah, it's sunny. That's right. I, I'd actually like to start with a couple of questions, if you don't sure. mind. Um, and these are my questions. I, I sort of want to set the tone for tonight. I want to anticipate some of the thoughts that our teachers might have. And, you know, we, I see at the Humanities Center a lot of scholars who are now uh, thinking about and working through food ways and food stuff as a way to understand our culture. I know you do a lot of work in that. Tell me why food? Why, why is food such a, you know, such a revelatory uh, lens to look at these complex issues of relationship and culture and landscape and people? I think in a lot of ways, food's almost the perfect interdisciplinary topic. 
you can't talk about food and not talk about production. You can't talk about food and not talk about consumption. You can't talk about food and not talk about identity. You can't talk about food and not talk about class and economic issues. And, and it just sort of naturally flows in this way that pulls together so many different topics that um, I, I think as a teacher, I, it's really interesting. But as somebody trying to identify something happening in society, it again becomes this through point for so many things. And there, there's a, a quote about food studies that says that it's inherently subversive. And in a sense, what that, that person's saying, right, it, it just explodes disciplinary boundaries the moment you begin to talk about it. Yeah, it's really fascinating to, to read your work and see your work. Um, we've got other activities that we've done at the center around this, but it seems like the kind of thing that younger students can really begin to understand well. And, uh, and I'm going to encourage all of our participants tonight to see not only this as a literal conversation about Starbucks and coffee, but ways that might apply to other commodities, other food ways, uh, particularly in the cultures they're from. Uh, Brian, I've got one more question for you. Sure. And this may or may not reveal the punchline of your talk tonight, uh, but you have to be honest with us. Uh, do you currently spend money at Starbucks? Um, not deliberately. I, I, <laughs> I go, I go in the way, and I, I'll sort of talk about this tonight. But um, yeah. I go when I'm away, okay. not in Philadelphia, and even more when I'm outside of the U.S. And I go and I pay the premium. Um, in order to get some predictability. Right. Well, I'm, I, I thought that might be a punchline because, it, of course, if you had said no, absolutely not, then we might anticipate that your talk is going to reveal some sinister, <laughs> sinister side to Starbucks. Um, <laughs> well, when I, uh, actually, when I finished the book, I, had, I, uh, I mean, maybe this is a way to start. Um, part of the way I did the research for the book is I went to probably 400 Starbucks in a dozen countries over a couple of years. And I'd often spend as much as 20 hours a week at Starbucks. And I went a good year not going to Starbucks after that. Um, <laughs> I'd, had, I'd had my fill. And now, now I can go without um, it just kind of driving me crazy. Yeah, you're the supersized me of the history profession. <laughs> well, I've, I've given you the mouse. Uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Um, thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, thanks for sharing part of your evening and afternoon with me. This is the cover to my book, Everything But the Coffee. And the subtitle is really what we're going to kind of play around with tonight. And that is this idea of learning about America from Starbucks. And I want to just start with um, just kind of laying out the time frame that I want to talk about. I really want to talk about this period between 1995 and 2007 when Starbucks is going gangbusters. This is a period, and I'll have a graph in a little bit that will make this even clearer, that Starbucks is going to open a store um, every six hours somewhere around the world. And as this Alice Cooper, you know, the shock rocker um, who sang the song Schools Out, oh, he's still alive, I guess he still sings Schools Out, um, said in 2008, it used to be said that as GM goes, so goes America. Now it is as Starbucks goes, so goes America. And well, I, I think Cooper probably overstates this in a sense of um, comparing Starbucks to GM in terms of the number of people it employs and the impact it has on the economy. I think he is right that, that in this kind of period between 1995 and 2007 or so, Starbucks is the quintessential American company. It, it sort of grabs the American imagination. It's in conversations all over the place. And so the, the question that I was asking when I wrote this book and I was spending these kind of endless hours at Starbucks is, well, what can this tell us? What does the success of Starbucks tell us about what we as Americans care about and desire? And that, that's really what I want to talk about. But, but behind that, and I think Andy got at this, is kind of suggesting a method that maybe some of you can use. And, and that method begins by really thinking somewhat differently about what we buy. And, and what I would argue and what I do in the book is try and suggest that what we buy has meaning. And, and this might sound simple, but it, what I'm trying to suggest here is that we're not sheep 
We're not led to buy things. We're not dupes. In some ways, we buy things because they matter to us. And it's that mattering that I want to talk about. But I also think you can look around you and think about popular brands, popular companies, and they help you understand what we care about and desire. And so I, I, you know, sort of what I want to show um, is that over the next um, 45 minutes or so. The other thing that um, I want to say, and this is sort of obvious, right, um, that buying is becoming um, and really did in the 1990s and, and has for a while become increasingly more important in American life. It's one of the fundamental forms of entertainment. It shapes our landscapes, but it also is um, an important way in which we define ourselves, we reveal ourselves, and we let people know who we are. And, and I want to think about that. And, and I, I want to also sort of make an argument, um, and I'll come back to LA for all the people in LA to do this a little bit later, but that the spread of buying has been enabled by a kind of retreat from public life. And by that, I mean the kind of decline in civic activity in America. And this has sort of been well documented, the decline in a, a kind of deep religiosity in America, a decline of community. And as these other institutions that sort of were our sources of connection have receded, buying kind of like water has sort of dripped in and flowed into these spaces. So these are some of the things that I want kind of larger kinds of questions that I want to get at over the next um, few minutes. Um, so let me just sort of tell a little bit of the story about Starbucks just to to set this context. And this is a picture of the first Starbucks store in Seattle. There's some dispute about whether this was the first store or not, but it, it's certainly one of the first stores. And um, Starbucks as a company started in 1971, and it was started by three kind of hippies who had graduated from the University of San Diego, um, the University of San Francisco, and they were looking for something to do. And they began this company as a way to kind of express their countercultural values about naturalness, about whole products. Um, they had read the Whole Earth Catalog. And this store was supposed to be a way to offer something better for people. And, and that's really how it started. And, and the first few years of um, Starbucks, kind of the business, it, it was slow growth. The company didn't do particularly well. At that point, they only sold whole beans. You couldn't get any beverages in the company. They would just give away coffee to get people to taste it. And the company would then sort of slow, kind of slowly grow. But then, but then its growth became meteoric. And this is, you know, really associated with um, Howard Schultz, um, the erstwhile presidential candidate who um, took over the company and really set um, his sights on making the company grow. And you can see this New Yorker cartoon, you know, where someone predicts that a Starbucks will open on your block. And it's, you know, a prophecy that seemingly will come true. And this, this graph sort of suggests this, right? Um, between 19 really 97 and 2007 Starbucks will you know just grow in kind of a meteoric fashion it will grow it'll grow gangbusters and that growth will be in the United States but also it will be around the world and as i said earlier for this period there'll be a Starbucks store um opening every 6 hours somewhere around the world and this is really kind of what I want to get at um, is thinking about Starbucks success and just a little bit of, um, uh, yes, my dog was barking. Um, I just want to, um, I just want to um, show you a couple slides that kind of will, will get at this, the kind of growth of the brand and it's a store in New York. Um, sorry. Here's a store in Paris, store in Germany. This is a crazy um, Starbucks. This was um, in the Forbidden City um, in in Beijing, and you know it was right at the kind of center of the the holiest and most important place it, place in um, in China. And, and it's actually an interesting story. Um, 
the, this store eventually would be closed, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, people campaigned against it, saying it violated kind of the deep historic traditions of China, and they did so over the internet, so that kind of tension is interesting. But the store closed, and I actually visited it, and it had reopened um, under the uh, Chinese company that used a green label and um, with a mermaid-like character on it, and um, it sold lattes and frappuccino-like drinks. So I guess that's some form of progress, right? Um, this is a Starbucks um, in Iraq during the height of the Iraq war. Again, kind of Starbucks is everywhere. This is um, Britney Spears, who had a very um, serious Starbucks Jones for, for much of her life. But, you know, in that period, really between, you know, 1997 and 2005 or so, Britney was, you know, one of the biggest stars going. Um, and Starbucks would, you know, find itself in endless, countless numbers of movies. And, and my favorite slide about kind of Starbucks success is this is from JFK Airport um, around 2005. And this is this sense that, that we can't be without Starbucks and we need to know when it's only um, 100 you know, feet away, that we need to know where that Starbucks is, that it's so important to our kind of essential sense of um, how we run our days. So here are the couple questions that I want us to think about. So Starbucks is wildly successful, right? It spreads across the United States and across the globe. But there's a question we have to ask ourselves. Starbucks isn't cheap. It, it wasn't meant to be cheap. And so why were people willing to pay more for coffee? That's the first thing I want us to think about. And um, I can remember early on in my research, I was in New York, there was this huge line at the Starbucks store and um, there was a stand outside that said it was selling gourmet coffee and nobody was in it. And I, and I don't think this is about taste. So I, I want us to think about, and, and that gourmet coffee store, that gourmet cart was selling the, um, coffee for 99 cents. So why are we willing to pay more? What, what, why does that happen? And again, I, I don't think this is really about taste. And well, I'll tell you what, let's, um, let, yeah. let's ask that question and see what people say. Okay. So let's ask it sort of, and I'm going to go back one for you just to, just in case, but um, let's put that to the audience. Um, many of you have commented on your coffee drinking. Uh, you know, we've sort of been joking about it in a fun way, but tell us, tell us what you think are the keys. Why is Starbucks so successful? Ginger Park uh, in Colorado says, holding the cup is cool. We pay more for the branding. What are well, the rest of you that? What, <laughs> Yeah, we, we certainly will. What What do the rest of you think? Why is Starbucks so, uh, why did it blow up the way it did? Suzanne Burton says, specialized coffee flavors. <laughs> uh, convenient, says Rebecca, although uh, while they're everywhere, they're, the lines are so long, it's hard to say they're convenient. Um, people know what to expect, says Sherry, up in Wisconsin. Convenient, says uh, Maria. Um, hmm. Ah, Ginger says that the pink drink makes her feel rich and swanky. Uh, <laughs> Renee uh, offers that Americas are swayed by marketing, add the addiction. Hey, there's Monica Hoyer. Uh, when someone uh, costs more, we place value on it. Sounds like a, a real marketing mind. Uh, <laughs> online ordering. Chris asks, do they even sell just coffee? I'll tell you, Chris, when I'm in line at Starbucks, uh, it drives me crazy that I just want a, a tall cup of coffee and I've got to wait in line behind all the specialty uh, concoctions that people drink. <laughs> We've got a lot of great ideas. Brock, usually a good vibe. Brock, I'm assuming you meet in the Starbucks rather than uh, the drink itself. Um, Abel says, it's just the right thing to do. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I read that incorrectly. Just the thing to do right now. Thank you, many great tasting choices. Yeah, uh, it's interesting, Brian, the kind, of, um, the kind of responses you got. Yeah, so many of these things I'm gonna talk about, about predictability, about treating yourself, about the way you look. And, and so this is, again, what I, if you think about the title of my book, Everything But The Coffee, and in some sense, the coffee is almost a prop to all these other values and ideas that I think are kind of part of it. And so that's really what I want to dig into now. 
So this is the other premium that I want, again, the question I want us to think about is, why do we pay more and why do we wait longer? Andy just said the frustration of waiting for a drink. And I want us to just sort of throw out a kind of big idea here, right? That, you know, I think that Starbucks meets the changing needs and desires of the broad American middle class at a moment of a historic retreat from public life. And so keep that in mind. And this is sort of what I want to demonstrate over the next few minutes. And I, I want to offer one more kind of setup, and I promise we'll just dive in. And I think there, there again, are important reasons why um, we pay more for things and why we buy things at all. And so I just want to break down some of the reasons for buying um, for us to think about. One is we buy things for functional needs. In other words, we buy things that we need. And I, I'll get to that. Um, and this is, if you can imagine, a kind of curve going upward. We pay more as these things happen. The second is we buy things because they fulfill certain emotions. And that is about feeling good and about what makes us feel satisfied. And the third reason why we buy things, the highest value, and I, I think we could argue, is aspirational. We buy things to make us look to others the way we want them to see us. And this is increasingly important in kind of modern life where we tend to not live in very tight communities where people don't know much about us other than how we appear. And so I want to go through a set of kind of reasons why people um, buy Starbucks that are this range between functional, emotional, and aspirational. And I just also want to add that a mass brand like Starbucks, you can't have 20,000 stores and only sell one thing. So that Different people buy different things at Starbucks. They don't all buy or get the same thing from the company. And, and so um, does anyone know what this is? Let's give that to the audience as well. Uh, please type into the chat box if you can identify this image. Connor Kaplan says caffeine. Connor Kaplan is right. It's the molecule for caffeine. So one reason, obviously, we buy Starbucks and we buy coffee is for the caffeine. And the interesting thing about Starbucks is that it is the most highly caffeinated coffee out on the market. And that is not an accident. The caffeine in coffee doesn't really come necessarily from the beans. It comes from the process of making it. And so... And once you've had, I mean, many of you can identify this, once you've um, had Starbucks, you need to keep that elevated caffeine up. And so I'm not necessarily suggesting that Starbucks is like, a, you know, the cigarette companies of old, but, but there was something kind of clever, right, about putting a lot of caffeine in the coffee. So one reason, again, why we buy Starbucks is, is really functional. If, if you're addicted to caffeine, um, you need to have it every day. The other thing is you have to kind of go back, if any of you are old enough to remember, and think about what coffee was like before Starbucks. And I like these two slides because they sort of help us think about what, star, what coffee was like. Coffee in America in the 1970s and 1980s was an industrial product. It came hot, relatively tasteless, in a mug that might even have rust in it like this picture. And it, and it was you know, pretty awful for the most part. And um, again, it was a, a kind of industrial product. And so one of the things that Starbucks definitely did was upgrade the category. It really changed the way people thought about coffee. This is even before the company really introduces lattes. Um, and they made the kind of product better. And so, I mean, one thing just to keep in mind is that this was, and this happens in the economy, there are products that are ripe for upgrading and coffee was one of them in in america but again I, I don't think that that i think that's part of it but again not one of the most important things going on here because i think more important than upgrading coffee i think starbucks became this aspirational product and the first way that it did that was to say that it wasn't mcdonald's and if one way to think about a starbucks store and to think about the products is in a direct conversation with McDonald's. 
in many ways, the company is the anti-McDonald's, at least on the front where you see it. At McDonald's, your food is waiting for you. It's already cooked. At Starbucks, they make it for you. At McDonald's, there's plastic seats and bright lights. At Starbucks, there's wood-looking tables, pieces of carpeting, wood floors, a kind of naturalness. And part of what Starbucks was saying is if McDonald's was the ordinary experience for Americans, we're going to give you an experience that says that you're not ordinary. And now we're getting into the aspirational parts of it. And so, again, if you keep thinking about it, by not going to McDonald's, by not buying McDonald's products, you say about yourself, you pay the premium so others can recognize this about you, that you're somebody who cares about quality, not value. That you're somebody who wants something special, not ordinary. And I think this is really important, that you're somebody who can appreciate and understand the finer things and tastes. And so Starbucks, again, if you think about it, was positioning itself almost directly from its, its appearance, its products, as something that wasn't McDonald's. And if McDonald's was ordinary, consuming Starbucks made you something other than ordinary. And I think, so this was part of the aspirational part of the brand. And, and I, I love this image, right? Here's a guy in a, in a suit and he's going label first, right? He wants people to see that he's carrying a cup of Starbucks. And, and I think that one of the things that Starbucks offered was affordable class making. And I have two stories I would just share with you that I collected from my research. One was a story um, where someone said to me, well, I can't carry my BMW with me everywhere I go, so I take a cup of Starbucks. And, and, and by that, he was trying to say that, that people would recognize his choice as kind of indicative of his social standing. And my other kind of favorite story is someone told me, this guy was um, at the time, is like the late 90s, and he was a, a new hire at a Madison Avenue for, firm. And he wasn't making that much money, but he wanted to look like he was prosperous. And so what he did was buy a cup of Starbucks on Monday morning. He'd take it to work, logo first, so everyone would see it. And then when was no, no one was looking, he would put it back in his bag, he would take it home, and he would fill it up at home from Tuesday to Friday. He wanted people to see him with the Starbucks cup in his hand because he wanted them to see him as someone who was successful. And you can hear this, this is from quotes um, from my research. People would say, why do you go to Starbucks? Because successful people go there. And I think maybe it will rub off on me. And I, and I just wanna say, remember, I'm talking about this period right now and I'll get to the present later. This period between really the mid 1990s and the mid, you know. 2000s. Another person said they went to Starbucks because it makes you look like you have money. So if we're thinking back to that central question, why would you pay the premium? You pay the premium so people see you the way you want to be seen. All right. Another reason why people pay the premium, and, and some of you mentioned this in your comments, I think that Starbucks in many ways sells predictability. Now, there are a lot of reasons to buy predictability. When you're on the road, when you travel, when you don't know someplace, you want to make sure you can get something. It might not be the best thing available, but at least it's decent. And this was an idea that, that McDonald's had really sort of revolutionized in the 1950s, and brands and chains in the United States have been trying to make this happen. So the idea of predictability was a satisfaction, right? That you were gonna get the same thing everywhere you went. You have to also remember in the 90s, Americans become much more mobile. There's way more travel for work. People are on the go even more. This, uh, this kind of, of value for predictability goes up as mobility increases. But I think predictability is even more is even more kind of complicated and interesting at Starbucks. And go back to this question about public life in America. Go back to this question I argued that part of Starbucks' success is about a retreat from public life. 
You know, really, in many ways, um, in the wake of the L.A. riots, there was a kind of inward look in America, a kind of fear of the city, a fear of collective places, places, a fear of people different from us. And we can, you know, these numbers sort of bear out if you um, look at statistics, everything from literally leaving Los Angeles and the cities to increased gun consumption to increased home security systems. People sort of went inward to a certain extent. But part of what Starbucks sold was not just predictable products, but predictable places. And the way they created those predictable prices, places was through pricing. And, and here I think this is really important to recognize. Starbucks was deliberately, in some ways, made expensive. And it was deliberately made expensive because that price point acted as a filter. Those people who couldn't afford to spend a little bit extra on coffee wouldn't go. And when they wouldn't spend a little extra on coffee, that meant the place itself was predictable. Now, I, I see Renee wrote about free Wi-Fi. It doesn't have free Wi-Fi till later. That It's actually pushed into that, but I can, I can talk about that a little bit more. So this kind of predictable space, predictable product, predictable people. People pay a premium for that predictability. All right, on, I, I wanna move on to sort of some kind of functional consumption. This was a guy who I met while I was doing my research. He's a lawyer here in Philadelphia, and I met him one day while I was doing research, and I asked him, you know, if he came to Starbucks very often. He said, every day, it's my office. And one of the things, and, and he did the math for me, he sort of added up how much it would cost him to buy, to pay for an office in downtown Philly, and um, how much it would cost, you know, um, to, to buy two drinks a day. And so, he sort of did the math and he realized that buying two drinks a day um, was cheaper at Starbucks than it was um, to have an office himself. But I think for a lot of people, again, who are on the move, as office spaces decline, free WeWorks, people paid for Starbucks coffee in a sense to rent space. They were renting a space in, in a downtown or popular area to use for an hour, for a day, for any set of time for a meeting, to do their own work. And Starbucks was sort of fulfilling this kind of void in society where people were increasingly working in different ways and they needed places to work. And Starbucks became, for many people, that place to work. I mean, they also, also benefited right mightily from the kind of um, laptop computer, but, but we can talk about that in another context. And, Hey, Another thing that Starbucks did, yeah, go ahead, Andy. Well, I, I I don't interrupt you because I feel like you're on a little bit of a flow, but I but now I have, so I'm going to ask my question. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times this this notion of doing research and and being in Starbucks and meeting people like the the guy you just showed. Yeah. Can you tell us? Can can we go sideways just for a minute? Can you tell us what it means to do research on a topic like this? What what exactly did you do, and what kind of question? <laughs> you ask and what, what does that research look like to uh to to folks from the outside um i spent a lot of time sitting in starbucks and um i had one of those black and white kind of marbled composition books out and you're I renting took, space <laughs> yeah well, I, I i took notes and i tried to figure out what people were doing and, and i would often position myself um in different places in the store. Sometimes I would try and sit really close to where the, um, the food service was. Other times I'd sit in the heart of the cafe. And most of the time I just watched, right? Because it was, you know, it was a little awkward to say, well, do you come here much? Um, but, you know, if I was open to eye contact and if I saw people repeatedly at some stores, then I, I might talk to them. The second thing I did fairly often is I would invite people who I thought had some expertise about Starbucks to join me at Starbucks and to tell me what they saw and what they observed. And that went everything from interior designers to experienced architects to I hung out with a lot of teenagers. Um, I would ask them what they liked about the place. And I would tell the story sort of through their eyes. and. The other sort of way that I did this was to try and make sure I went to stores at different times a day um, 
to get a feel for how the flow of the stores changed. But I, I that that guy who I met, I met just through repetition. Um, sure. I, I, I used that kind of ethnographic focus of um, just watching. But I've done this. I do this with um, classes a lot. I, I send my classes on ethnographic visits to get them to do similar research. It's a really great assignment. And I even do this thing where I'll take a a class of maybe twenty students and I'll we'll break down the store and I'll have you know one group of students will just sit out by the drive through if there's a drive through. Some will sit in the cafe. Some will try and listen to the baristas. Some will study the interior design. Some will do work on the bathrooms, and then we get back together and kind of try and put back together what we what we have observed. Well, I, you know, it's funny you say that because I was going to have a follow up question that you now will allow me to expand a little bit, and that is, um, you know, as you described it, I, I initially wanted to ask, you know, hey, Bryant, you're you're an educated, smart looking white guy. How does that in <laughs> you know influence how? you move in that space and how others react to you. Now I can extend that to say when you take classes, uh, students from Temple who uh, you send out to these spaces, do you do they receive based on their demographics, their age, their skin color, et cetera, their gender, do they receive different interpretations of that same space ethnographically? That's a great question. And, and the answer is probably sadly obvious, right? as somebody who can easily pass for what i mean white an older looking white guy um bathrooms are a good example and i talked a lot about this when the two african-american guys were blocked from the bathroom at the starbucks here in philly i was never denied access to a bathroom at starbucks um, i was never asked if i bought anything because i often didn't buy anything um and my students and um, i actually did this with a group of teachers i taught um a class about McDonald's and Starbucks with a group of public school teachers in Philadelphia. And we did those ethnographic um, visits and they had a really different sense of the place than I did and their entitlement to the place. And it was, it was good for me to, to, to be with them, but I, I think that's definitely true. And I saw, again, we'll go to the bathroom. I, cause it was such a crucial issue in some ways. I saw, um, I never was denied access to a bathroom, but I saw plenty of times where, um, you know, people of color were denied access to bathrooms. Yeah, and that's that seems to be, you know, particularly as, as our teachers consider ways to structure this for the younger students, whether it's first person or third person, it seems like an important lens to look at any of these um, these uh, corporations or spots of community or even food ways, but thank you for sharing sure. that. Yeah, and, and, and so I, I would just say another functional way that Starbucks is, um, people use Starbucks is for bathrooms um, and access to bathrooms and often will buy something. And I, I you know, remember the story of um, being in New York and watching three people who were visiting and they all wanted to go to the bathroom and all three of them bought um, a drink. So. Starbucks made um, eight, ten, twelve dollars on three flushes of the toilet, but but this is also um, an important point um, to make that Starbucks here, just like with the renting of space, is benefiting from the closing of libraries, for instance, or the the sort of peeling back of money from libraries. Starbucks benefits from the lack of investment in public bathrooms. They offer this service as a way to make money. They regulate who's in it, and um, they make it in some ways harder for us to pay for them, pay for those bathrooms when we need them. And I think the quote that I really play around with is um, um, when Bloomberg was still mayor of New York, he was asked why New York had so, so few public bathrooms, and he said, we don't need them, we have Starbucks. But what Bloomberg didn't say was that the Bronx and Manhattan have the same population. And at that time, Manhattan had 250 Starbucks and the Bronx had two. So that meant, you know, who had access to those kind of alleged public bathrooms? But again, in terms of why we go, here's a functional purpose purchase, right? So I just want to talk about this community issue a little bit for a second. And I, I wanted to look at these four, have us look at these four slides to see them, right? 
as the kind of state of community in America in some ways when Starbucks takes off, the state of community in America for middle class Americans when Starbucks takes off. Really in the 1990s, it's the height of the gated community. It's the kind of nadir of small towns and main streets as they're going out of business as people are kind of moving to the mall. To the mall. This is a moment when people feel like they need to drive military assault vehicles through the downtowns and suburbs of community and where houses have as their most conspicuous architectural feature a garage, often an automatic garage where people can pull in safely without having any, any interaction with the street. And what I want to suggest is that this kind of pullback from community, this kind of loss of connections, is something that's really important to Starbucks success. And um, I also want to suggest that Americans don't necessarily like it. And, and as a kind of illustration of this, um, I wanted to use this quote from that great film about Los Angeles crash, where Graham says, he's talking about what we're missing, right? It's a sense of touch, he says. In any real city, you walk, you know, you brush past people, people bump into you. But in Los Angeles, in some ways, the quintessential city of the post-war period, nobody touches you. We're always behind metal and glass. I think we miss the touch so much, we crash into each other just so we can feel something. And what I want to suggest is that Americans in the 90s are beginning to kind of yearn for this feel, yearn for this connection, but they're not sure how to do it, right? They're, they're also worried about safety and their fear of others. And so Starbucks kind of breaks at that moment. And a, a couple other quotes about this kind of decline of community, um, this famous book by Robert Putnam, a Harvard professor called Bowling Alone, who talks about how um, Americans still bowl in the 1990s, but fewer of them belong to bowling leagues at loss of connection. Cultural quit, quit critic James Twitchell says, we'll do anything to get affiliation. And that's part of what Starbucks offers. And I think the first place they offer that is through inventing their own language. And if you think about this, this is kind of brilliant, right? That in order to go to Starbucks, you have to master a certain language. And language, as we know from, you know, from your students, um, any of you, you know, spend any time with teenagers, is a form of creating alliances, in-groups and out-groups. It's a way that people kind of come together. And so Starbucks developed its own language that would create a sense of belonging. And, and um, I mean, I saw this while I was doing my research. I would see people practicing their orders. I would see them asking um, baristas, employees, to, to coach them how to order. There are web pages that teach you how to order. And on the other hand, I would see people working at Starbucks, the people behind the counter, roll their eyes when people didn't order the right way. All of that, right, both in the affirmative and in the negative, was creating a form of community. Again, something that Starbucks did, right, cleverly, I think, through the use of language. It also essentially coached the people who work there to sort of nurture this sense of belonging. And this is from a, a Starbucks employee manual. Um, I actually, um, someone gave, gave this to me sort of, uh, one, you asked about how I did research. I, I should have added this. Um, some of my best informants were former Starbucks workers. They were great at telling me what went on in the stores. They were usually former by the time I talked to them. And, this was actually from a current Starbucks worker who literally took me into a back alley and slipped me the employee manual, which um, I, I wasn't supposed to have. Um, but um, this is how they're teaching employees how to interact with customers. And if you, if you read it really quickly, um, you can see that each form right, of um, service is a higher level of creating a connection to the customer to the point, right, that you name them. And so this is why Starbucks, I think really importantly, doesn't give you a number when you order. It calls out your name, that sense of recognition. And I have had, even had people telling me that they would go sometimes just to hear their names called. And I'm not suggesting, right, that this is a deep and abiding sense of belonging. Sociologists talk about weak ties. 
kind of thin ties and connections that we we make. And I think part of what Starbucks is selling here and part of what we can see is this kind of weak connection. Another place that Starbucks kind of imagined and sold belonging was many Starbucks stores during this period. They've, most of them have since taken these down, had community boards um, that were supposed to kind of link the store and the customers to that place. Interestingly enough, um, Starbucks um, would, um, <laughs> As far as community boards go, you were allowed to put anything on them, um, a Starbucks representative once told me, except anything that had to do with politics or religion, you know, sort of narrowing that sense of community. But again, offering some weak ties and people paid a premium for that. Another reason why people paid the premium, and again, I, these, these definitions aren't necessarily, they're not mutually exclusive, but one of this is self-gifting. In a world where buying means more, buying yourself something is a way of kind of affirmation. And, and literally, I would have people tell me they use Starbucks as a form of almost mood management and rewards. And, you know, students would say to me, well, I had a t test today and it was really hard and I studied a lot. So I bought myself, you know, a grande mocha frappuccino. And you know, someone would say, oh, I had the worst day. Um, you know, my girlfriend broke up with me, so I bought, you know, a Vente um, Frappuccino with extra whipped cream. And I think that part of this is, as buying becomes more, we reward ourselves through buying. I also think that there's a kind of interesting dynamic going on here where the excessive calories of the drink adds to a kind of illicit pleasure to them. And so, um, I think there's a, a, a really interesting kind of um, tie in there and, and, and a kind of emotional form of buying that people respond to. So the, the last thing I, I want to talk about is um, a kind of aspirational buying and a kind of notion of politics that Starbucks is selling. Um, I'm kind of looking at, you know, I'm kind of looking at the questions and there's lots of interesting questions that uh, we can dig into from the cups to the Magic Johnson stores. Um, happy to talk about all that stuff. But, but one of the things that Starbucks also sold was a way to represent yourself as somebody who cares. And somebody who cares about the environment, someone who cares about the world, someone who cares about the least fortunate. Now, often through caring, you also sort of express the kind of superiority, but we'll, we'll, let's, let's think about this for a second. The sense of caring through buying also is a product of a kind of declining and broad distrust in political institutions. And, but people again still, so one way that people in the past said they cared was through their political affiliations. I mean, it's still true now, right? But um, there was a decline in that. And so enter the corporation that will say, that will allow you to show you care by buying a green product, right? You care about the environment, they allow you to express that through what you buy. They allow you to express a way to change the world. Maybe you don't believe politics can change the world, but again, corporations are entering this world, entering the realm and saying, look, if you buy from us, we'll make water cleaner. We'll make the developing world a more prosperous place. All things that Starbucks says, right? And again, we'll clean up the environment. And, and all of these are ways to communicate something about yourself and your values that paying the premium will allow you to do. And I want to particularly focus on a kind of global um, order that Starbucks plays around with. During this period that I wrote about, the stores were full of pictures of the growers, of the people who supposedly grew the beans for Starbucks coffee. And interestingly enough, they were always pretty happy. Um, um, I visited a few coffee plantations and farms and never saw anyone this happy, but you can see what they're saying. We can't serve you great coffee if farmers can't grow great coffee. But what's interesting is Starbucks also is selling you, and it says this, right? a way for you to show that you care. And here's what it says, you can feel good, you, right, can feel good about your choice of Starbucks coffee because we work together with farmers to help them improve their livelihood. It's how we do business every day. And grammatically, right, they have actually made you the subject, not the farmer anymore. And no place is this more interesting than this, um, 
this was the tagline or a little phrase that went under a picture of Starbucks farmers. And, and listen to what this says. Everything we do, you do. You stop by for a coffee. Just by doing that, you let Starbucks buy more coffee from farmers who are good to their workers, community, and planet. Starbucks bought 65% of our coffee this way last year, 228 million pounds. And we're working with farmers to make it 100%. It's using our size for good. You make it possible. Way to go, you. You become the subject. You're doing something without sacrificing anything. You're still getting your coffee to help the world be a better place. This is the kind of politics, right, that Starbucks is selling without sacrifice in a sense. And people are willing to pay the premium for it. Um, this is their fair trade blend. Um, I, I'll just skip over this and I'll just talk about this for a second. Um, Cause I think this is actually one of the really interesting um, things that Starbucks does. This is ethos water. This was a water that Starbucks marketed then and they said with a lot of signs and fanfare that they would pay five cents of every bottle of ethos water to global um, water projects. So again, you could, you could buy ethos water and they would tell you this and help sort of make the world healthier and cleaner. The interesting thing about this is that Starbucks at the time, you know, in say 2006, 2007, a bottle of water was about a dollar fifty at most places. Starbucks charged a dollar eighty for that bottle of water, so they paid five cents, but they essentially charged you twenty five cents to feel good about yourself. And people paid the premium because they like the way it made them look. There's no way that they tasted anything different in the water, right? And so the idea here is, I mean, almost like a new form, if you know anything about kind of medieval history of absolution, you can pay to kind of wash away your sins in a sense. And again, people were willing to do this, right? To be seen as somebody who cares, but also to contribute to fixing problems without really sacrificing a ton. And Starbucks was beginning to sort of suggest that this kind of pain-free model was a way to kind of create a set of politics. Um, so that's what I think that, that combination of functional, emotional, aspirational buying in various ways, right? That also depends on what we want, how our lives have changed, the decline of the public, fuels Starbucks growth until um, 2007. And so the first thing I, I want to, to think about here for a second is Starbucks begins to sort of drop, it begins to lose same store sales, which is a kind of indicator that Wall Street uses for brands and profitability. It begins to close some stores in 2007. Now, why is that date important? This is before the crisis, before the crash. Starbucks is losing some of its audience before the bottom falls out of the economy. And I think that's an important point to recognize. And I think the reasons are that Starbucks is no longer able to provide some of those aspirational and emotional needs that it had in the past. And essentially, that's what I want to just talk about for the next few minutes. Um, here's a, just a, a letter about a store closing. And, and I think um, part of what I want to suggest here is that the brand is consuming itself. Um, part, of, part of what happens is when Starbucks grow, grew so fast and so quickly and was everywhere, it no longer seems special anymore. Kind of high-end brands often need a little bit of scarcity to have value. And so I can see Suzanne said market saturation. Yeah, it, it, it became so everywhere that it began to appear like McDonald's. And if it was like McDonald's, you go back to that earlier slide, then you couldn't get a kind of class bang for your buck. No one saw you as kind of wealthy and sophisticated. They saw you as ordinary. So Starbucks very growth begins to eat away at its value proposition. I think that's one thing that by 2007 begins to start, um, begins to start 
kind of happening. A second thing that happens again and closely related is Starbucks gets so big, it begins to kind of eat up so much real estate in the country. It begins to sort of push smaller companies out of business that people begin to resent it. And so rather than sort of, you know, Starbucks being identified with a kind of cutting edge or at least a kind of in the middle feeling of kind of middle class and upper middle class ascent, it seems like something that's taking away from communities. And so one of the real big pushbacks against Starbucks, one of the real, one of the real places where it faces competition is through independent local coffee shops. Now, I think this is important to recognize, which is a side note, I think actually Starbucks creates the space for most of these independent coffee shops rather than putting these business rather than putting these companies out of business but it begins to sort of eat away at the kind of class resonance emotional resonance and sort of aspirational qualities of starbucks i think many people um you know if you live in a community and you have someone visiting you and they want to go get a cup of coffee you probably wouldn't take them to Starbucks at this point. That would reveal that you don't know your community very well. You might take them to a local coffee shop. That Again, that growth of the local is a product in many ways of, of Starbucks success and a pushback against it. A third thing that happened, sort of taking away some of Starbucks core audiences, it began to get really beat up and challenged over how it treated farmers in the global marketplace. And I don't wanna to make too much of this or suggest that it's too big a deal, but um, Starbucks, and I'm happy to elaborate on it, got into kind of a beef with, um, got into a whole beef with Ethiopia, with Ethiopian and Ethiopian cotton, um, coffee farmers. And it was, Starbucks was selling Ethiopian coffee and it was revealed that it wasn't paying very much for that coffee and there were, several ways in which Starbucks began to lose its ability to show that you cared about other people and other places by going there. And this is a, a kind of cartoon that's, that's beginning to kind of capture that, right? That, you know, this farmer is being asked to push this Starbucks, you know, rock up the hill while people kind of smugly enjoy their tall and venti coffees. Well, if that's the cartoon, right, people aren't necessarily going to see you as someone discerning and caring of other people. So the, the, these kind of pressures were mounting on Starbucks during this period. And a kind of fourth thing is that, you know, Starbucks um, is often seen as kind of second wave coffee, right? There was the kind of Maxwell Health, the kind of corporate coffee, then you sort of get Pete's and Starbucks, these kind of bigger chains. And then you have third wave coffee, all of these kind of independent coffee shops that it really are kind of making better coffee. Coffee, um, we can, some of you probably said this early on, Starbucks beans have a little bit of a burnt quality to them. Um, that's in part to hide the kind of difference between all the beans. It's also um, a way to kind of um, hide imperfections in the coffee. So Starbucks is pretty good beans, but not the best beans. And so there's all these independent coffee shops that are sourcing their own beans that are more sophisticated in their coffee knowledge. And so if you want to seem discerning and someone who understands quality, right, Starbucks isn't the place you're going to go after 2006, 2007. There's all these other options. Part of what I'm suggesting here is, right, all of these challenges, challenges on the kind of front of how they treat coffee farmers, challenges on their impact on local communities, challenges on the coffee they serve the uniqueness of it, begin to erode Starbucks kind of core audience. And that's happening again before the crash in 2008. And I think it's revealing what Starbucks response is at first. Starbucks first response is almost a recognition that its brand has lost some value. And beginning in 2008, 2009, Starbucks begin to open stores they're called, they're still Starbucks. They don't have the Starbucks name on them. And they're named after the street that they're on. And this is one from Seattle, 15th Avenue, Coffee and Tea. In a sense, this is, this is an admission in, in a really kind of profound way that your brand has lost value when you hide the brand. 
And this was a strategy that Starbucks took for a little while. Um, they didn't open many stores this way, and the strategy was pretty, um, pretty uh, widely revealed in the press so that they weren't so stealth anymore. And so then Starbucks sort of faces a kind of dilemma. And I think what you see Starbucks doing in the last few years is meeting this dilemma in a pretty interesting way. And that is by recognizing essentially that the company has lost its aspirational qualities. That essentially what Starbucks can do is be the default cup of decent coffee and be everywhere if it needs to be. And I think this has been the better branding kind of strategy that Starbucks has pursued, a better recognition of its audience, a better thing for us to read than the more aspirational attempts that it that it tried through the stealth Starbucks and they opened some signature stores. So an ad like this, right? This is this is a sign on obviously a sign on a highway that doesn't suggest a kind of aspirational brand. It just lets you know that the next highly caffeinated predictable predictable cup of coffee isn't that far away. And Starbucks, um, I, someone wrote this before, right? I think it's, it's been pretty brilliant that Starbucks has basically tried to buy every single store in an airport or along the roadside. This is where the value of predictability is the most, right? When you're in flux and in transit. And so this is a leveraging of the predictability and kind of middle quality of the brand that I think has been that that's really effective. Um, Starbucks, you know, has become increasingly ordinary, right, in the sense of selling Christmas drinks, of selling holiday kind of flavors, um, of being in supermarkets. They resisted this for a long time, thinking that that this would be a kind of downgrading of the brand. But now that the brand has lost its kind of aspirational tone, I think this is a really smart way to kind of go about, you know, being everywhere. Again, being the default cup of decent coffee. And, and this is what a mature brand does in many ways. Um, another kind of evidence of ordinary Starbucks in its heyday would have never had instant coffee. That would have taken away its kind of coffiness. Um, Renee writes, Starbucks in, um, in Target yeah, that's exactly what this strategy is about. Be where people need you. Don't fight on the kind of high-end aspirational quality because you can't provide that anymore. And so um, I just want to end thinking about, um, you know, how and if Starbucks Starbucks can get its mojo back. And um, um, I, I, I think it, it will be hard for Starbucks because this is the way branding and culture works to be the kind of cutting edge brand again. Can it, I think it's hard for Starbucks to, con, it will be hard for Starbucks to recapture that kind of aspirational class go where you, um, glow where you buy the brand and people understand you as someone who's discerning, sophisticated and um, you know um, upper middle class. But it has recovered in part by again, being everywhere and allowing people to have a predictable cup of coffee, a predictable space, a bathroom if they can pass and get into it, and to have the kind of basic functional needs they want, the occasional kind of emotional satisfaction of, of self-gifting, of a place to meet where libraries close earlier um, and People don't have access to other meeting places through churches and community centers. All those things that can it can become. I think that in many ways, Starbucks has become like the Gap. It's a brand that doesn't raise your kind of class status, but doesn't lower it. And I think where you see Starbucks kind of moving now and making its kind of greatest efforts other than kind of drive-throughs and you know, at Target, um, that kind of brand in the middle is overseas. And why? Because when they go overseas, they can recreate the kind of glorious moment of that period between 1997 and 2007, where people wanted to be seen with the Starbucks cup. And I'll just end with the story um, from my research. At, at one point, um, 
I went to Guadalajara, Mexico to do research and it was a really hot day. Um, and it was a Sunday after church. All these are relevant to the story. And I went by this store and it was a really beautiful store with um, air conditioning, but nobody was in it. Everybody had bought their Starbucks cup and was standing near the road. Why? Because they wanted people on their way back from church to see them with the Starbucks cup in their hand. And it's that kind of moment that Starbucks, I think, will increasingly have to go abroad to get will it pursues a kind of more ubiquitous everywhere strategy here in the United States. So I hope that was helpful. I hope it suggests some kind of ways to think about teaching brands and even Starbucks. And um, happy to answer questions and continue the conversation. Thanks, Brian. That was really fascinating. And we have a bunch of questions that are stacked up in the queue. And I'm going to encourage all of our attendees to now chime in and ask questions. We have uh, uh, we have just uh, a few more minutes left. I'm, I want to start with Renee's question. Renee has been patient with us um, and asked us a few times. How much do you know? How much of their coffee right now is fair trade? This is a really complicated question. Um, and um, so Fair trade is a labeling system. And basically, in order to get fair trade labeled, you have to do a certain number of things that the company um, transfer um, will give you a fair trade label. Pretty early on, Starbucks opted out of that labeling system for its own kind of system of sourcing. So Starbucks basically created its own system of sourcing that it said was better than fair trade. Um, whether it is or it isn't, I, I mean, I don't think you, well, it's not. But um, so at the time, it was really only buying about six or 8% of its coffee was fair trade, and the other 80% or 90% was this, its, its own labeling system. My guess is at this point, even less Starbucks coffee is fair trade. Interestingly enough, that, that designation and that issue seems to have lost some of its um, cachet and value to people. I don't, like see a lot of people talking about fair trade anymore. And that to me is another interesting question. Why um, do we not um, necessarily care about um, fair trade the way we used to? And why do actually Europeans and some others care about this issue more? And, and I, I think that might be one way to think about it. Someone also asked the question, does it pay farmers well? Um, Renee asked this question. This is also really complicated because it depends who you mean by farmers. Starbucks pays a little bit more for coffee than other people, but it's not clear that that gets to actual farmers. That means it's paying middlemen or large landowners a little bit more. Whether that gets back to the actual people who pick the product is a little hard to figure out. Coffee is a really complicated product, but um, so when Starbucks would talk about how much it paid farmers, that's kind of misleading because it's its not really, it, it's hard to get tracked back all the way to figure that out. Thank you. Uh, Dakota is asking, uh, are you aware of Starbucks making any pledges to reduce single use plastic or to change the packaging of their products uh, to be more sustainable? So, yeah, I mean, Starbucks talks about this all the time, right? Um, and has made some real efforts. You know, I don't like. I don't know how many um, people listening are old enough to remember that when Starbucks first started, they would offer you two cups. And I remember thinking that was the greatest thing, right? You weren't going to burn your hand anymore in your cup of coffee. Um, and then they went to the brown, which symbolized kind of um, kind of environmentally friendly um, Java jacket. So they're constantly making attempts to limit their footprint. Yet, they don't do, you know, they're one of the great drivers of the, of the to-go business. And so, well, they talk a lot about it until they really attack um, the to-go business. I don't see how they do it. And I write about this in my store, my, my book. Um, you, you know, Starbucks is supposed to have in, um, house options of cups that you can use, ceramic cups, but they, they rarely make them visible. They rarely advertise about that. Um, they, you know, 
create a to-go business that that creates more environmental problems than they're going to solve by the small problems they do. And 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 the other thing is that they've really been resistant to kind of fully um, cups that use fully and completely reusable products. Um, they're kind of convinced that there's a lingering taste to them, and they um, haven't done a ton on that front. So there's more work to be done. And, and I think this is something about Starbucks um, kind of, Starbucks is really happy to overpromise and not always completely deliver. And I think that they trust that their audience isn't going to ask too many questions. They, that the audience, in a sense, only wants the kind of appearance that Starbucks offers them rather than the kind of full engagement with the products and its interaction with place and people. I, you know, it's funny. I've, uh, I started tonight's webinar with um, a question that I, I did not intend to be flip. I asked you if you spent money at Starbucks and I, I was kind of looking for a punchline and I'm still at the end of this session, close to the end of this session, not quite sure if there's a, a sinister nature to this or not. And, and I guess that is the layer of trying to understand the role of corporations in modern America. You described the, um, the Starbucks employee who, who talked with you kind of slinking out into the back alley. And that really does kind of paint a picture of you know, of, of a whistleblower, of somebody who's going to get in trouble if, if he shares with you the, the inner workings of Starbucks. And maybe that's true of any company, you know, they don't want to be splashed, splashed out. But I still can't quite figure out if this is sinister or not, particularly in that, you know, mid 80s to mid 90s sense. Um, is it your sense that Starbucks was uh, taking advantage or is this just the way business works? Um, I, I think it, the way I would say it is Starbucks is ordinary. And, um, but in that ordinariness, which they would never sort of cop to, there is good and there's bad, right? And, and um, you know, Starbucks got a lot of, lot of good press, for instance, for allowing, it didn't give its workers health care, allowed them to buy a relatively affordable form of health care. But that was really the way in which they were able to get a slightly higher grade and better educated workforce than McDonald's. It was right. And so, you know, whenever you begin to really sort of kind of look hard at the questions, what you get, I, again, I think sinister is maybe too strong a word, but, but you also don't get the kind of shiny example that, that they necessarily want to portray themselves as. And, and, and I think that is inherent in the system itself. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I'm also curious if you can speak some to what is just the natural transition between generations, uh, mid eighties, mid nineties, you know, those are now parents of uh, younger people who are drinking coffee with much more regularity than they did the generation before. Ginger Park's 12 year old daughter has some very strong feelings about coffee drinking as I can see from the chat. But kids today don't wanna drink necessarily what their parents are drinking. So is Starbucks just <laughs> aging with its original population too? I think there's some of that. Um, though teenagers, I think, continue to really like Starbucks in part their yeah. parents like it, but it also gives them a chance to kind of act a little bit grown up. There's not a ton of regulation within a Starbucks. It, it, it's sort of perfect, right? For teens, yeah. there's a fair amount of kind of mobility and autonomy. But for parents, many of the things I talked about, about predictability of the people there, it's a kind of trustworthy place. So it's a, it's a, a pretty good first out of the house kind of place. Um, and I, I think that's still true. I, I do think that Starbucks has very little cool left to it. Um, yeah. And that might be, you know, having parents in it, but it's also, Part of it's the maturing of the brand. It's hard to be everywhere and still be cool. It's hard to have 20,000 stores, which inherently means that you have a mass audience and be cool. I mean, cool needs some scarcity, needs some cutting edge, and that can never be the mainstream, right? So if I think that's more what it is. And I, I do think that, that kids in suburbs often where there isn't a lot, there aren't a lot of cool alternatives, they're not, they're not really rejecting Starbucks. In fact, they, they embrace it perhaps more than ever, right? As the one of the few places they can really go and be out and, and have kind of 
some attempt to act kind of grown up. Um, so I think it's more, it's, it's actually a little bit more about the kind of maturing of a brand than the kind of alienation of some customer, like the alienation of younger customers from adult audiences there. And the other thing I would add to that, Andy, is, Andy, is that people, different people use the store at different times of day. And if you think about it, teenagers get off school, you know, at 3, 3.30, that's like a dead zone for a coffee shop, right? Um, you're not getting the morning rush. You're not getting the afternoon rush. People who work are kind of heading home. And it allowed Starbucks to kind of fill its stores at a time of day when it wasn't necessarily able to get a lot of customers. So I think they embraced their teenage audience. They they generally would not um, in public. They were they were always very circumspect about saying talking about this because they didn't want to be seen as pushing caffeine on teenagers. That's a great point, um, Brian. Tell me this. Tell us this. Um, how did Starbucks respond to this book? <laughs> um, well, I didn't get much access to Starbucks. I mean, I, I had this thing when I was writing the book. I'd write um, them every week and ask if I could, you know, interview certain people. Eventually, I was able to kind of do a little bit of work with the company. But when the book came out, um, they, I was on CNN with. Uh, um, weekend and um, they issued a statement saying that um, I was wrong and then I was supposed to be on a broadcast with Howard Schultz one time and he backed out right uh, when the show was supposed to start and in his um, second autobiography he takes a shot at me of not understanding the, the company very well. That's nice. You've got a presidential candidate taking shots at you. That's, the, that's a sign of a history. He didn't name me, though. He didn't name me. But it was, I had written a, an op-ed, actually, in the Christian Science Monitor um, that um, around 2007, 2000, right before the book came out, saying, you know, how Starbucks lost its mojo. And he spends like a, he does spend a good two pages saying why I was wrong. Right. Um, I wonder if there are any other last questions. We're almost out of time tonight. Uh, please, to our audience, if you've got other questions for Professor Simon, please uh, type them into the chat box. We'll give everybody just a moment to uh, consider their thoughts and get their keyboards in action. Um, any other final questions? Looks like folks might be bonking after their uh, guzzling of coffee, uh, Brian. <laughs> I'm going to then leave with uh, one last question, and that is, sure. um, you know, in your own work in American studies, and as we discussed earlier, foodways, and uh, specifically in this uh, this webinar, the Starbucks and coffee. What are you working with next? What's what's next on what's your current research project? Um, I'm actually writing the history of the public bathroom. It's um, it's long, kind of twisted history in American life. Well, I'm not going to ask you about that research. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really do appreciate your insights. Um, and I, I know our audience really did uh, learn a lot from what you've shared. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And I want to thank all of our uh, attendees and uh, participants tonight for joining tonight's session. Uh, it's been fantastic to have such a, uh, an interactive and uh, engaged room. Uh, please do follow the National Humanities Center uh, on our social media, particularly on our Twitter feed, uh, both the Center and the Education Department, and our Facebook page. You can also go to our website and see uh, links to sign up for many of the activities that I've shared tonight, as well as uh, be updated on new opportunities and initiatives to come. Um, our next session is scheduled for February the 6th. We'll be working uh, with a local scholar from University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Luke Bovins, who's a professor of philosophy, will lead a session titled Tess, Teaching Ethics with Short Stories. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to uh, open the end of webinar survey. After you complete that, you'll be able to download your certificate. And as always, I've recorded tonight's session, so you'll be able to go back and listen and linger on the topic, uh, maybe match it up with the PowerPoint or the readings, and hopefully find ways to share this with your younger students. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, have a great day at school tomorrow. I'll see you at the next Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.